Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for August the 7th, 2020. This is episode number 18. Today, we'll be talking about driving the Polestar 2. The Cadillac Lyric makes its debut, and the Audi e-tron gets its price tag slashed. I'm Dominic Chioni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. He also puts together the super awesome videos for the new Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. Uh, so welcome to gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. So see, we were driving some stuff this week. Uh, Kyle, I think you had the Actually, first, Tom, were you driving anything this week? Well, you usually say what's charging up in your driveway. Yes. And uh, this week, there's nothing charging up in my driveway because I haven't had power for four days now. I live in New Jersey, and we got hit really hard by this hurricane. So uh, nothing's charging up my driveway. And no, I don't have any um, press cars this week. Luckily so, because there's trees down everywhere, and I, I don't know if I could have returned them. Uh, so no, it's just uh, the Model Three trickle charging on 120 in my garage right now. So right on. This is Kyle's uh, week. So so if Tom drops out, it's because his power is spotty. But uh, he's here and, and uh, recovering from that storm in New Jersey. But but Kyle, so you're kind of in that neighborhood too. I want to give us a heads up on on how your week's been going. Right. Well. Uh, Let's see. I'm trying to think about my week. Uh, we were in Colorado. We first uh, earlier started in Moab, I guess, is where we left you last week. Um, we had an amazing day of off-roading the Model 3 on our road trip. Uh, I mean, we had this thing like in the air. I just have to make a huge <laughs> testament here. Tesla builds a solid product. I can count at least five or 10 times that I was like, oh, that's it. Car's done. Batteries ripped out uh, from just jamming it into rocks. And it's fine. I mean, the car hasn't shown an error warning. I looked underneath. Things are somewhat still bolted in place. I mean, it's just an incredibly strong vehicle for what we put it through. Um, and then we, we came up to uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, just north of Denver. Um, been working up here at uh, Alyssa's sister's house. Flew to New York uh, two days ago, drove the Polestar 2, which has been uh, extremely exciting. Guess if you're a YouTube audience, that's us in a little bit of the sandy parts of Moab. We just had an absolute blast tearing it up. Um, so right, I went to Polestar 2 launch and this is a whole lots to talk about. But um, before I, I go on about the car, what would you guys like to know about it? Uh, well, I'm interested in your your take on the handling dynamics. Yeah, well, they, yeah, and I, I want to know if you want to buy one. <laughs> <laughs> I okay, so as okay, this is probably the first electric car that I've had uh, as much of an emotional, like happy connection with. When you drive a Tesla, they're extremely capable, extremely fast, but you don't really feel anything for the car. It's just an iPhone on wheel. It's a device. Uh, this was more like totally geared towards my style of vehicle because premium interior, huge focus on driving dynamics with the performance package. Um, and, and I just thought the whole, the whole thing was really cool. Well thought out. Now the Polestar two isn't, it's not like an attention grabber from a statistic standpoint, not any metric really stands out above their competitors. And, uh, but when you add everything up, like the interior, the, the, the sound system, the UI, the driving of it, the styling mainly, uh, you know, I think it's, it's more than the sum of its parts in this case. And it's really a compelling car. Um, we talked a lot last week before I get into driving dynamics about how this car will be serviced. And a lot of our viewers of the podcast had commented down below in the video, you know, where yeah. am I going to buy this thing? Where's my support for it? And um, I was lucky where I got to basically interview the whole Polestar executive team before going to drive the car. And uh, I'll be sharing an article on that at some point here soon, whenever I have time to write it. But uh, what basically it comes down to in Europe and China, they're going to be leveraging their existing Volvo dealer network. So for whatever it was, 99% of orders, you're never more than 26 miles away from the nearest Volvo center. 
in the US, we have franchise laws that legally will not them let them allow or allow them to work on a non uh, franchise partnered car. Uh, so, so is this the the, the Tesla? Because obviously, I I don't understand your laws, but is this like similar to why Tesla have issues with selling cars, or is it a separate thing? It's uh, the same group, separate issue. Right. Okay. Cool. Sorry, yeah. carry on. <laughs> uh, so. Right. Yeah, we have a lot of backwards laws here. Yeah, we can't really. It's hard to do it like a hybrid um, private sales and then and then a dealership model. It has to be all in one way or the other. Hundred percent. And because mm-hmm. Geely's already comfortable with the dealership model, I I think they're actually taking the right approach for them. Uh, you know, they're already launching a new car company, coming out with a car. Mm-hmm. They don't have a ton of money just to throw around. So I think leveraging their their partners is going to be smart. So here's how they're doing it in the U.S. They're taking their like top premier best performing Volvo dealers in three regions. You have Manhattan Motor Cars in New York, Galpin in Los Angeles, and I forget the San Francisco partner. But those partners will then bring on an entirely new franchise of Polestar separate from Volvo. And it will be a uh, individual space in a high traffic area. Think like in New York, they had their their pop-up location right near the Apple store on Fifth Avenue that everyone knows, the underground one. And there are tons of foot traffic going by. So similar approach to Tesla. And when you go inside, they'll have two or three cars. They'll have product specialists. They will not be incentivized to sell you a vehicle. Uh, and the way that you order a car is through a tablet in the store, or you just go home and order it online. So that's something we're comfortable with from the Tesla thing. Yeah. Now, what they they leave room uh, for questioning from my side is because they're going through a dealer partner legally, uh, Polestar cannot tell the dealer what they can contract the final price of the vehicle to be. So if the dealer really wanted to somehow give you five grand off or charge you five grand over, legally, there's nothing Polestar can do about that. However, Uh, The way that they're going to control the final transaction price, at least as best as they can, is the dealer network is not going to carry any inventory of the product. It's going to be a, you know, these cars will be sitting at port waiting to ship direct to the customer. They'll drop it off at your house or you can pick it up at a Polestar space. And uh, and by controlling the inventory, the dealer doesn't have to pay floor plan on cars. There's not as much incentive for them to discount a vehicle to sell it because they have 9,000 white ones on the lot in the same spec. So this is, uh, we'll see how well it works in practice, but this is at least what they claim. Uh, for right. servicing, they will have dedicated Volvo uh, dealers that are part of this network uh, that they're expanding out with their partner sales to offer service only through those dealers. And within a 150 mile bubble of that dealer, you'll have free transport with a, with a loaner car dropped off Etc. But if right. you live in Kansas, so gonna, it's not. So, it's a no go yeah. for service. But they're going to hit the major metro metro areas, and if you go out 150 miles in all directions from those big population centers, probably going to be most people watching this who want to buy a Polestar probably covered. It's 85 percent of all people who have ordered and raised their hand in interest in the vehicle. In Canada, they'll have three or four service centers, and it's they have something like 96% of orders in Canada covered just right. because everyone lives in you know three areas. So, I believe it's in Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal in, in Canada. Exactly, right. and Toronto is going to have two service centers. So you can, still buy, you can still buy a Polestar 2 if you don't live within the 150 miles. They're not going to decline right. your order. You just got to, if it, if it does break down, it's not free to get it back to them. That's the thing. It'll be that 150 miles is free. They'll still arrange all the shipping from wherever you are. You're just going to have to pay a fee, which they did not disclose per, I guess, mile, or I don't know how they're going to charge it to get it back to the nearest Polestar Center. So like me living in North Carolina, right? I'm six, 500 miles, 480 miles away from New York City. I would have to pay that difference to get it up to New York City. But if I bought the exact same car, with more room for the dogs, the XC40 recharge, <laughs> I could just drive it to my local Volvo dealer and they could work on it. I, I think you'll find the XC40 will have different driving dynamics than this one, even though it's on the same platform. Totally it's agree. A, this is going to be it, much yeah. more of a performance-oriented di- chassis. Uh, and it's not a Pol- The thing is, it's it, it's not a Polestar, which by the sounds of it, I'm trying to sort of read between the lines of what you said, that when you got in the car, you just had that 
feeling that's really hard to describe, but you were you felt that it, there was something special going on with it. Yeah. So, you know, like if you drive a really fun car, we talk about the fizz, like a manual transmission, like a Morgan or some of the hot 911s, like you get something cool. It wasn't that, but it was on the inkling of this. And it was something that it's like, wow, electric cars can actually be a little bit special. And um, it was mostly just down to the interior design and material usage. I think they've done a good job at what uh, the future of car interiors should look like and be made with. Because, uh, you know, look at all of, all of their competitors. It's either leather or it's material that looks like leather or is fake leather, as we say, or faux leather. Right. This, they said, look, we don't even want to mimic leather. We're going to go and make some really cool materials that have never been put in cars and, you know, make this the new premium. And they've done a great job. The seats were made out of like sportsman, really cool wear stuff. I mean, I was very, very impressed. And that's what Polestar does, right? It's run by a designer. All the technology comes from Volvo. That's true. Kyle, did they say anything about mobile service at all? Like uh, if you have a minor... Uh, issue and you're 50 miles away, um, do they have any type of mobile service like Tesla does? Uh, other than the the software updates where they're able to try and get into the car and fix things that way, no, they did not mention anything about it like a Ranger service. Yeah, I I, th I think that would be a really a huge benefit if they did for, for the fact that they just don't have many service centers. I, I had a minor problem with my Model 3 and uh, it was super inconvenient at the time for me to go to the Tesla service center, which wasn't even that far away. And they sent somebody out and, and, you know, fixed it on the spot while I was working. And I just thought that that was a great service for, you know, considering the fact that you don't have this huge dealer network. So, uh, I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still concerned that people that people that I think are going to gravitate towards the Polestar are, are premium customers that, that enjoy premium experience. And, uh, the, the, the fact that there's not a lot of service centers, um, it, it might be like kind of a hassle. I could see somebody, you know, plunking down whatever to buy a fully loaded Polestar. And then the first problem they have, it becomes this huge issue that they have to somehow get it to the dealer and it's inconvenient. And then them just saying like, you know, just take this thing back. I don't want it. You know, I, I, I'm definitely concerned about the after sales and service, but uh, hopefully it, it proves me wrong. No, I actually think you're correct. And I think they're sort of expecting it. I just don't think they can go out and build out a huge network for this niche electric car to start. So I think they're doing it, although it's not ideal, like you were saying, especially if you're on a road trip and your car breaks down in Kansas. But uh, I think they've chosen the right approach here, uh, especially in Europe and China. You know, it's obvious they just want to leverage their Volvo network and they're they're done. Uh, but but in the U.S., I think uh, doing it this way is OK. Now, it's probably up to their partner who they sign up with to offer mobile service. So like Galpin in Los Angeles, for example, they always go above and beyond for like everything. I mean, they have a Starbucks in their showroom like these guys are wild. Uh, they might choose to offer mobile service for their customers uh, right. and others may not. And then this is where it comes to how much control does Polestar have over the buying and servicing experience of the vehicle. And that's really the downside of, of having dealers. You're, it's either gonna be amazing if you choose the right ones, which it sounds like they have, or it's gonna be pretty poor. Now, this these three locations are just for them to launch. They were gonna be going into you know the Dallas, Austin's, the Atlanta's, uh, things like this, maybe Boston, uh, sort of not tier two cities, but still pretty close. They're gonna be doing those um, within the next year. Right, I think and Miami. By the, mm. Yeah, by the end of two years, they'll have a network uh, built out. Okay, yeah. So, but it, it sits price-wise, it sits between the Model Y at the moment, the all-wheel drive long range, and the all-wheel drive performance. Yep, it's sixty grand basically, Spec and then sixty-five for the performance pack, which are both fully oh, loaded okay. options, and you get the okay. seventy-five hundred dollar tax credit. So yeah, so it sits between those, and but people are probably going to be choosing between the. Model Y performance or Model 3 performance and this. I really it... don't think you're going to see a lot of Tesla owners cross shopping this car. I mean, if you're buying a Tesla, you just you're getting a Tesla. But I think what this is going to be really good for the the Mercedes, BMW, Audi, uh, potentially Volkswagen, maybe even existing Volvo customers that 
for whatever reason, don't want a Tesla, whether it's just there's 9,000 yeah. of them in, in your neighborhood and you want to be a little different. I think that's a big thing for me. It's a differentiator. I think that's cool. Well, like, you, um, like, you, like you said, you, you can make an, a, like an emotional connection with that interior. And, and a lot of people will call the, the Model 3 in, or Model Y interior is kind of cold. You know? I'll say getting out of the Polestar and into a Model 3 because I drove a Model 3 in. You know, I went to my parents' house. My my mom's Model 3 was sitting out there, so I wanted to just get it moving a little bit. Right, I yeah. drove it into the city, parked it in a garage, got in the Polestar, drove it all day, got back in the Model 3, and I was like, wow, this sucks. I mean, I mean that seriously. The Polestar uh-huh. is a much better place to be. Right. And, and yeah, so, someone who owns a, a Model 3 themselves and adores it, and you can't say enough nice things about Tesla. No, I, you're, everyone you're, you're knows probably, I love my Tesla, but it's just yeah. it's great at certain things. Right. But there's other cars that can do things better too. But the, and, in terms of like the, the performance, though, like the real world performance, mm-hmm. there's like there's to do naught to sixty in three and a half seconds, or even four point eight if you're talking Model Y, um, all wheel drive, long range. I think it's like four point five or four point eight, even on public roads. It's, it's, you know, there's so few times when you can do it safely and not endanger other road users. And so, okay, so it might be slightly quicker, not to 60, but has it got that dynamic, that sort of instant, because some EVs, when you do like stamp on it, you get that millisecond delay and it, it doesn't, like Teslas are brutal in their accelerations. How did you feel about that? Okay, well, this goes back to Dom's original question about driving dynamics and feel. And this is uh, this is interesting because it's not uh, mind-blowing in any category. The acceleration is great. I did have some issues with the accelerator pedal tuning. I thought it was a little soft on pedal tip-in um, where you, know, you had an inch of travel that didn't really do much. And then when you put your foot in a little bit more, it gives you a big burst of power. And these are things that they can tweak over time with software. Yeah. You know, they were very clear. These were these were the only six cars, uh, Polestar 2s, in the U.S. They were flown in from China. Um, you know, they literally had to fly them. They had, I think, 10 journalists in New York, and they're going to do 10 in Detroit, 10 in San Fran, and then they'll probably crash test them. They, but that's my guess is what they'll do with them. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I, I want to take that with a grain of salt because – while they were production spec, I, the software I don't think was fully finalized. Uh, they yeah. said there was going to be a revision or two before the U.S. deliveries come. Uh, but, but let's talk about uh, – oh, sorry, Tom. Go ahead. Yeah, Kyle, just a question. Are you just guessing that they're crash testing them, or did they say they're no, going to no, crash No, no, I was guessing them? that they were going to crash test those okay. six. Because I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they won't crash test them at all in the U.S. They're not going to sell enough of them for it to qualify to be – to need to be crash tested. So, hmm. I, so I, I they want to do the, the US crash test on that vehicle. Well, they want to do 10,000 in or tens of thousands next year. So what is the limit on crash tests? Uh, uh, the, the the there's it's kind of like a soft limit. Um the 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 Highway Transportation Safety Board kind of decides if the if they think the vehicle is going to sell uh in volume, they pick them. So there is. I don't believe that there is a limit. Um, it's just the lower volume cars don't get crash tested. I remember the the i three didn't get crash tested. I think th- until like the third year of production in the U S. or late in the second year. Um, mm-hmm. So that the you know a, a new car coming into the market like this that hasn't proven that it's going to be in the hands of a lot of people yet. Um, I, I bet you yeah, we don't see crash tests on that for at least a year if they do it at all. That's interesting. I was under the impression that every car had to go through at least some safety ratings, but that that's good Most to know. Most people think that, but it's yeah. not true. There's a lot of cars in the U.S. that don't get crash tested. The hmm. manufacturers can take it upon themselves and they right. can give it to um, the, the crash tester and, and pay for it and say, we'll pay for you to crash test it. Um, because we want to prove that it's, um, you know, a, a, a super safe car. But, um, uh, you know, the, the, the two agencies that do the crash testing in the U.S., they don't take every car. Right. And it's possible they've already done this because it's built on the same platform as XC40. It's the CMA architecture. Right. And so, they, you know, it's really no different from a uh, XC40 recharge that's coming or some of the other variants. Um, but let's talk about how it drives very yeah, quickly. Let's get there. It is um, 
off the line, uh, you know, I, I always do, I call it the taxi cab drag race in New York City. You're always trying to get out and it's great at that. You know, there's no power fade in. When you nail it from a launch, it gives you everything instantly. And it's very, very potent. Um, regen all the way down to a stop with brake hold. So true one pedal driving, which is great. Uh, way more than the i3 that we have and uh, stronger than the Model 3 rear wheel drive. Because uh, when I got into the standard plus, I noticed regen didn't feel as strong as the Polestar. So I was very impressed with the regen capabilities. And also, it doesn't blend in brakes until you're almost stopped. So you're really maximizing the amount of regen. And that's the benefit of permanent magnet motors. You can just pull those things back to zero. Um, took I took it up to Bear Mountain, ripped it around some mountain roads. And I drove, I think I was the only one to be able to drive the performance and the non-performance variants. And I okay. specifically started in the non-performance variant because I thought this is the one most people are going to want to buy. Um, after getting details about their reservation numbers, it seems an overwhelmingly majority of orders are for the performance package, which I yeah. think is pretty cool, actually. But I am surprised by that because I didn't think you'd get a performance-oriented customer. Um, but yeah, the the standard car was great. It was uh, very firm over little bumps. I would say probably too firm uh, to be considered compliant. However, when you roll it into a corner, you had some chassis roll, but balance is really good. It's 51% uh, weight to the front, 49 in the rear. Two identical 150 kilowatt motors, but it prioritizes the rear motor under partial load to give it a rear wheel drive feeling. Um, however, at wide open power, it's 50-50, of course. And you can lift off oversteer this car. You can get it, you know, have a little fun. And then um, there's no way to fully disable traction control, but I had it in sport mode going around roundabouts just right on the edge of, of grip. And it was a very predictable, really actually quite fun. The performance package, which is what we're looking at now on YouTube, gives you uh, Brembo brakes, which were completely designed by Polestar with Brembo to get a big brake kit that's capable of low drag specific for electric vehicles. Um, you know, I think some of the the cost and, and the, basically the, the finance department was kind of upset about this decision because they obsessed over these calipers and right. spent way too much money making them. And I just thought that was so cool. And that's what you get when you have, you know, a designer engineer running the company. You get uh, a totally different suspension set up with adjustable Olin's dampers, which are similar to the Polestar V60 that I drove, where you can crank them up or down. And, uh, but but really hand adjustable, you got to reach, you got to reach into the wheel arch and, and give them a turn. Right. I think it's something where you're going to set it for your preference once. Oh, okay. So it's not about, or maybe you do a track day or something. Or Exactly. It's okay. doable. Like uh, all you do is pop the hood, twist them, and then you can reach in underneath the rear wheels. So it's probably a three minute operation, but you're not going to say, oh, I'm driving on the highway and now I'm going to get on a twisty road. Let me park on the side of the road. And I mean, maybe I would do that. I did do that with the V60, but it's doable. It's, um, you know what? I just think it's really cool. And what they were saying was, you know, they benchmark tested all the electronic control dampers and they're just like, nothing performs like these. And that's true. Uh, Olin's dampers in the industry, in the performance industry has always been seen as like top, top, top notch, like the best. And there's a reason they're mechanical because it's probably better. And um, so I drove the car with it set uh, right in the middle, not on the softest side and not on the firmest side. And I actually found it to be more compliant than the standard car. So mm -hmm. I would imagine if you get the performance back, back down all of the damper settings, it's smoother than the non-performance. Uh, and then likewise, if you crank it all the way up, it's extremely stiff. But uh, the way I had it, you know, I, I have it on video. You'll see a video probably early next week on Inside EVs driving this. Uh, and we were ripping up some great roads, full tire squealing. And you can see, you know, I demonstrate basically the chassis control of the car um, is incredible. The turn in is extremely sharp, but not to the point that's sketchy. The steering ratio is perfect. The Model 3, Model Y is too quick of a ratio, in my opinion. This is much better for like a back road drive. And, uh, and of course, you know, just cruising down the highway, you have pilot assist, which, you know, it keeps a great distance to the car in front of you. It uh, maintains its lane extremely well. It has four cameras and it's uh, able to be fully software updated over time to add functionality. Uh, right on. Hey, so final, final uh, thing on this, would you buy one? 
I have been thinking about this and I don't think I'd buy the Polestar 2 for one reason only. I definitely like the Polestar 2 more than the XC40. However, right. uh, even though it is a hatchback, I think we would have to go XC40 for the dogs. And uh, it wouldn't true. be our only electric car. We would either keep the Model 3 and get the XC40 recharge for Alyssa to drive. It would probably replace our i3. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, just because I think the level of driving that I do, uh, the car can be as good as it is, but you still have to rely on these third-party charging networks that, as Tom talked about last week, uh, you know, can you rely on them today? The answer is no. Maybe in three months from now, that answer will change. Uh, but their reliability is is questionable at this point. When you arrive to a station, will it be up and running? Right. And uh, Polestar is working on this with the Google integration in the UI. It will have real-time charger status. It'll know how many are available and it will route you to the fastest ones and the least traffic chargers on your trip. Nice. That's cool. All right, That's cool. Well, and, thank and you very just, much just for on the, using oh. Android. So I, I, I know we've got to move on, but very quickly on Android, does it work? Because I tried to move to an Android phone once for about a week, and I, I'm just <laughs> so, uh, you know, in terms of my mobile phone, I couldn't work it. But inside a car, does it work? Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't know it's Android touching it. It's, uh, I mean, coming from an Apple user here, I think it's, uh, you know, forgetting Tesla's simplicity of hitting navigate, go somewhere. It's the best in the marketplace. Uh, extremely snappy, great functionality. Voice control was was really good. It's the only car that I actually think I would use voice control in regularly uh, because, of course, nothing else ever understands you. And it was quick right. and snappy. I was having conversations with it. Uh, I was impressed with the UI. Right on. Hey, so let's roll on to the big news of the week. So the Cadillac Lyric has debuted last night. The all-electric uh, luxury crossover was revealed in Detroit during a special live stream event. Uh, to touch on the main specs, it, it will offer beyond 300 miles of range and uh, DC fast charge is at 150 kilowatts. It will come in rear wheel and all wheel drive. The all wheel drive version will boast a, a little better performance and 50 to 50 front to back weight distribution. The rear wheel drive will have uh, 20 to 30 miles more range actually than the all-wheel drive version. Uh, so that would you know put it over 300. It'll be interesting to see if the all-wheel drive version actually hits 300. But anyway, so uh, it, if it, it should use, we were thinking it will use the 250 kilowatt motor in the back and probably the 180 kilowatt motor in the front. That's part of uh, GM's flexible architect electric architecture. And that would add up to about 430 kilowatts or 577 horsepower. So we don't know. They didn't give us zero to 60s or, or quarter miles or anything. But, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be plenty powerful, especially in all-wheel drive. Um, it will have optional 19 kilowatt AC charging. And interestingly, I was looking at the uh, press release last night, and it, there could be an option for higher higher than 150 kilowatt DC charging. I'm not sure that the language is kind of mushy there. But uh, that's something to look out for. Um, so this 2023 model, let that sink in, 2023 model, is said to be the spearhead of GM's electric technology. But, but Tom, does it really hit the market, or the target? Well, you know, the big thing that I'm really down on GM about the vehicle is that 2023, really, you know, we, 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 we've got to wait, you know, uh, two and a half more years for GM to come out with like a, a, a luxury, long range, uh, electric, fully electric vehicle. You know, the looks wise, I think it's nice. I actually really do like how it looks. I'm not thrilled with the um, Lexus front end. It kind of right. seems like they copied that, um, the, the, the front end with the kind of the chat, the, uh, where the uh, uh, Lexus grill comes in and out. Uh, but, okay. you know, I'm, I'm just, I, I was left wanting more. I'm also concerned, where is this vehicle going to be made? Jim wouldn't answer that. Um, I, I'm thinking it's possible that this might be made in China uh, and exported to the U.S. Uh, I know China's going to get the vehicle first. Uh, so, you know, 
there's a lot we don't know about this vehicle. And unfortunately, we didn't get a lot of information at this reveal. Uh, I was left wanting more. Uh, I'm not satisfied with what I've seen. It was kind of a big disappointment for me. And, uh, you know, for a brand that, you know, only sold about 150,000 vehicles le last year, uh, they, they needed to come out with something big and make a bold statement, get people excited about the future of Cadillac. I mean, kind of like with the, the Ford Mach-E event, that was a gr really well done, great event, in my opinion. I was there. Everyone was dialed up. You see how right. many people were, 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 were responding on Inside EVs to all the articles that we wrote. It seemed like Ford just invigorated the brand again with the Mach-E. And um, we didn't get that with Cadillac. It was just kind of like womp, womp, womp after that. And yeah. uh, I think it's unfortunate. Yeah, Maki really they did a really good job gen generating excitement for for their for that new electrification effort. And here, man, Cadillac really needs to generate some some interest, some excitement. And uh, I'm not sure. Like, if you look at the interest at, at the whole presentation during the live stream. There were like 2,200 or so people, you know, watching it as it debuted. Those are pretty small numbers. Kyle, you saw the the video count this morning. Yeah, Martin, can you take the car off the screen? Thank you. It's so ugly to look <laughs> at. Um, it, it's really bad uh, from my perspective. I, I don't think I like it at all. I just think we need to save our audience at, you know, the the, the nausea this morning. So basically, Man, uh, yes, I, I clicked into the live stream. I saw 2,000, like 100 people real time. And I was thinking, I'm like, you know what? I just did like the worst, like what I thought to be the the worst video I've ever done for out of spec, which is a live stream in and out of service driving in New York city, bumper to bumper traffic in the pole star too, which was the only thing I had time for. And, uh, and it was doing like, it did like 6,000 views real time. I'm like, I, we, with a very much smaller subscriber count blew past the, uh, analytics for, Cadillac's new electric vehicle reveal. And I think that tells the story right there. It's not a car for us. It's not, you know, no one cares, honestly. Um, as a European standpoint though, Martin, what do you think about the styling and the vehicle for your market? Because yeah. I think it might be the right style of vehicle for our market. It just hasn't captured the general uh, audience yet. Yeah, I mean, Cadillac means nothing over here, first of all, apart from watching 80s movies and talking about caddies, you know. So it, there's, the, the brand has no... It's, it's, if they sell it here, it's at a standing start. The car itself, I think, from the front has a bit of Lexus and a bit of Mercedes-Benz EQC about it. From the side, the way it kicks up at the back, I think it has a little bit of the Dyson scrapped project about it. Um as in those windows taper down towards the back and uh, it's you know, a bit of Range Rover Evoke about it as well in places. So styling wise, I mean, I think it would be fine. They won't sell it here because who's Cadillac? It, you know, in Europe, it means absolutely nothing. And so uh, as a compelling EV in terms of specs, it just hit all the right all the right numbers for a car that should be out this year here in Europe. So the cars that it would, that, you know, that we would be comparing it to, that we're buying at the moment, if you think about, well, you know, it's going to have 300 miles of range. Um, as, uh, as Dom said, it will have 150 kilowatt fast charging, but may go a little bit quicker. Okay, it's got the crazy big 33-inch screen. I mean, okay, that is impressive, but they were talking about the resolution and the dots per inch, but they weren't talking about what motors it's going to have. And uh, and all those kind of things. And I just think that when I was watching the, the, the presentation, if you're talking about the, the dots per inch of your display that's coming out in three years' time, two and right. a half years if we're generous, and rather than the, the, the characteristics and the driving and, you know, 19 kilowatts on board charging, useful. Lots of countries, you know, Nordic countries and France, the, uh, uh, European countries have three-phase, not so popular here, but... You know, you can find plenty of 22 kilowatt AC posts, so that's kind of good, but it's all good for now. It's all good for now. Like Super Cruise right. is is good, but it's out there now. So um, this is a car that it you know. Let me compare it to Tesla when they announce something like the Roadster. When Elon does his one more thing, and out the back of a of a truck, uh, a trailer comes a Roadster, and he goes, "Yeah, it's going to do 600 miles." Like no one believes that in that moment can they make that car <laughs> doing 600 miles. I mean, you've got the hardcore Tesla nerds online going oh i think you'll find if you stack two 100 kilowatt hour packs on top of each other uh, it will do like yeah that would be dog heavy and dog slow it's not a sports car but 
clearly they have a roadmap and a timeline and they, 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 they can look into the future and go, you know what, I think where we're going with battery technology, let's say 600 today, because when that Roadster comes out, it's always dessert, as, as, he, as, as Elon says. When it finally comes out, it probably will do 600 miles, but it couldn't do then. So if, you know, Cadillac could have said yesterday, here's the car and given it wild and crazy specs and and if they'd have had confidence of where their ultium battery technology development is going they've got two and a half years to get there their engineers could have developed that but really they came out with a car that any automaker with access to reasonable batteries could make that car today that's the thing martin i think it's you know it's it it would be great if they said and this will be on sale in your cadillac showrooms march of 2021 you know like eight months from now i mean I think it would have been okay. You know, Cadillac seems like they got the ball rolling. But to see that and then be, yeah, and you can have it in nearly three years. You know, like, that's just, it, it, it was actually sad. Um, as you said, Cadillac doesn't have a presence in, in uh, Europe. But, you know, it was like the benchmark in the United States forever. And see to see the brand, you know, where it is today. And they actually make some really nice cars. Yeah. But to see how it, they're struggling, like I said earlier, I think they only sold about 150,000 cars last year. And now this is their vision for the future. This is That's it. That's the best they can do. And we'll, we'll get you this car in two and a half years. And um, But we're going to sell it in China first, and we're going to make it there. And uh, we, we're not going to say where we're going to make it yet here in the U.S. And, you know, even, I mean, you talked about the 19 kilowatt onboard charging. Uh, you know, it, the electric's different in the U.S. as is in Europe. You've got your three-phase power. Um, but here in the U.S., Tesla tried this already the, the, with the dual onboard chargers, and they realized it was not worth doing because you, we, here in the U.S., you need a 100-amp dedicated circuit to have 19.2 kilowatt, you know, AC charging. Almost nobody has that right. here in the U.S., so Tesla abandoned it because it created too many problems with their customers. People were ordering it, and then they realized they couldn't install the charging in their house. Then they were mad at Tesla for, for selling it to them on something that they needed to spend $6,000 to upgrade their, their house electricity in order to use it. Um, I think Tesla has done a great job and settled in with the sweet spot of like 48 amp charging, around 11 kilowatt. That's more than what you need for overnight AC charging and you know it seemed like okay Cadillac just look at what Tesla did they took 10 years to learn this don't make the same mistakes that they have okay you're coming to the market late one of the advantages of coming to the market late is looking at what the competitors the early adopters have done and learning from them and not making the same mistakes so you know I, I know it might seem like a little thing but to me it's an indication that they're just they're just not paying attention to what's going on in, in in the world of electric vehicles right now. And it's, like I said, it's super unfortunate. I was really hoping that Cadillac would come out with a, a, a kick-ass, all-electric, okay, I'm going to say it, Tesla killer. Well, Tesla competitor, <laughs> but not a Tesla Maybe. killer. I know yeah. uh, I, I'm just doing that for the comments. Right. Um, but um, <laughs> Just to like see the Tesla look on my face. Editor, you know, and for crying out loud, give us something and – this just wasn't it. This was, uh, like I said, this was the big letdown, and uh, I kind of feel bad for the brand. Um, I, I, I don't see good things in their future if this is the best they can give us in three years from now. So I don't want to be totally down on on the thing because, yeah, but uh, I don't want to be, you know, but I, I will say there's things that I do like about the car, like the Fascia. I don't know if I've heard anyone say they, they really like the front of it, you know, Um I mean, it's all right. I kind of like the idea of the the blade headlights down the fr down the front there, the uh, vertical headlights. But uh, you know, I, I like the roof line, the way it kind of slopes down and it's nice and long. And of course, it's all glass. And I like, I really like the way the tail lights wrap around and up the sides, up the C pillar in the back. And uh, if you can see it rolling, there's it has like uh, flush handles. But at night, it looks like they're going to be lit up. And I kind of like that's a nice touch. Um, you know, range seems to be okay. But I, I was speaking with uh, more than one colleagues. And uh, the edit editor in chief of their John Neff suggests that maybe they should have brought out the uh, uh, the electric Escalade size SUV first. They have this plan. It's one of their planned products. Um, and I, I would say I can't disagree with that. Instead of having this thing coming out in you know twenty twenty and twenty twenty two as a twenty twenty three model, they 
they could have had this, you know, Escalade size uh, thing. They could have called it the Gigantic, you know, keep that IQ on the end. It would be based on the Hummer EV, so it would have 400 miles of range. Uh, crazy performance. I forget how many. It was like 10,000 foot pound of torque, 0 to 60 in three seconds, because it's the same platform as a Hummer EV. So they instead of they could even even you know they, because they brought up this Hummer EV as to be as their, their sort of halo, but that, that's really kind of taking the places of what I think the Cadillac brand should be for for GM. It's real halo kind of you know sub brand. Um, and yeah, I think they could have come out with you know really great specs. I mean, a zero to sixty in three seconds Cadillac with you know haul your boat SUV, all the bling you could possibly pack in that. Uh, and then you could stick a you know nice fat price tag on that. Uh, yeah, and and then it all like a year earlier. So yeah, to say we're, it's it's kind of disappointing to see that this late date and the the announced specs on the vehicle don't really push boundaries like you'd want something that needs to expand the brand, you know, it has to make a statement. And I don't, I don't think we can't hear you in the back, you know, the, or the people in the back can't hear your Cadillac. Come on, speak, speak up, give us something. But uh, yeah. Well, I totally agree that an Escalade suburban, you know, Yukon XL sized vehicle, uh, those should be electrified. You know, they tried it years ago with yeah. the hybrid version. For those that are listening outside of the US, in every like suburban town that like Tom or I live in, every soccer mom drives a suburban or an Escalade and they're just running their 6.2 liter V8 idling around everywhere. So a really good range extender electric person or a full battery electric covers 90% of the use of this vehicle. And I think if Cadillac came out with a Escalade electric, that's their right. biggest name that they have. Everyone knows the Escalade. That would have been just great. And they wouldn't even have had to change the styling much. Just put a big battery in there, give it some 300 kilowatt DC fast charging. Well, they did have like a big rip. mock-up of the uh, SUV uh, earlier on their EV day earlier this year. And, it, you know, it looked pretty much like an Escalade, you know. I mean, you could see, you could you could stick the Escalade badge on that and it, it would be fine. But, I mean, they just put out a new Escalade. And when they were talking about, they had a special call with reporters about the, the Lyric launch. And they opened actually talking about Escalade and they had like 6,000 pre-orders or something. But I don't know. It was, it's a gas vehicle. I didn't really pay close attention to that. But, yeah, I think I think the main uh, the main takeaway from this whole thing is that, you know, Cadillac really needs to up its marketing game and, you know, maybe their product game is still, if they want to be really be successful as, as a the spearhead of their electric technology. But yeah, so, but let's move along. We got to keep this tight. We've got a short time today. Uh, so we also want to talk about another new story. Audi has significantly lowered some prices and increases the, increase the range of uh, the e-tron or, or at least one of them. They have the regular like long, long roof e-tron and they have the, like the, the beautiful, uh, Coopified <laughs> sport back e tron. So the, the 2021 e tron, it starts from uh, 65,900 MSRP uh, plus like a thousand dollars or thousand ninety five dollars in destination charge. And that's effectively uh, $59,495 after deducting the $7,500 federal tax credit. Uh, the 2019 e tron was offered at 74,800. So that you know, there's a Big change right there, and the the uh, Sportback now starts at sixty nine thousand one hundred dollars plus a thousand dollars ninety five destination charge, but that's effectively effectively sixty two thousand uh, six hundred ninety five dollars. So you know that's a, that's a big difference. Uh, mm. The recently, okay, right talking about that and then so yeah and the range talking about the range real quick the e-tron the regular e-tron's range has increased from 204 miles of epa to 222 miles of epa and it, well the sport back the range uh, will stay at 20 218 at, at least for now so this is pretty interesting uh tom what do you think about this price cut just well i i uh, I mean, who doesn't like a price cut? I, I think this is kind of where it should have been when it came into the market initially. Um, you know, I, I, I've I've always been a fan of the e-tron. I think it's a really good uh, electric vehicle. I've driven them. I mean, I 
I, I've said in the past, I'd, I'd like to own one, but not at the price that right. it was offered at. It was just way too high. Uh, so I think this brings it in line with where it should be. And w as for the range, you know, uh, that's um, uh, Audi's opening up more of the capacity uh, of the battery to be used. That's right. And that's why the sport, when the Sportback launched, they already had made the decision to, to open up more of the <clears> capacity. <throat> that's why the Sportback, the, the range isn't changing. It already has those extra miles added into it. One of the things that I thought was interesting, though, um, when, uh, when I was driving this in the sport back, it was when the sport back first got, um, uh, the, the first public display of it, I think it was at the, um, it was at CES or the LA Auto Show. I, I can't remember now, a couple of years ago. Um, I was talking to the Audi engineers and I said, oh, so that means you're going to open up the extra capacity for the existing e-tron owners, you know, on some kind of a update or something. And no, they weren't. Yeah. They said, no. Yeah. We can't. I was like, wow, that's that's you can't open up the additional uh, kilowatt hours for the existing owners like they're just going to be stuck with the with the with the buffer that they have. And yep, they are. And uh, unless something's changed, that was like a year, you know, year, year and a half ago. I mean, com contrast that to Tesla, where, the, you know, they they just have like total control over the battery and they can just do an over the air software update and and just you know increase or decrease the amount of usable capacity you have i mean it's just a, a little example of how tesla you know maybe has taken a better global view of their electric cars than the existing oems and and thought things through uh, a, a little bit more uh you know and as much as i like what audi's doing i, I like what the volkswagen group in general is, is doing i think they're probably you know as serious as any legacy automaker about electrification um, and and even that look at the problems they're having with uh, the ID3 with the software and look at here with the e-tron they they wouldn't have the ability to control the capacity it has to come out of new vehicles I think they said that there would have had to been a hardware change um, to, right. to, to to do that they couldn't even do it at a dealership with, with a with a software uh, upgrade so I mean it's just it, it just kind of shows you that they're still thinking like the way they had thought in the past about these cars. And they're just yeah. not there yet, as good as the cars well, are. Well, touching well, on the range I'm again. Sorry, oh. I'm pretty excited. I There's a delay. You go ahead. I was just lagging out there. Okay, I was, I was just going to say real quick, uh, just speaking about the range increase, uh, part of that also comes from they've optimized the drive system to say so the front motor disengages um, you know, a lot more when it's not needed. And of course, they have the, the larger buffer. So yeah, go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, so uh, I was pretty excited about seeing new manufacturers such as Ford and now Geely Group with Polestar 2. Uh, so Mustang Mach-E and Polestar 2, I believe, are the first non-Tesla electric vehicles to offer over-the-air software update capability to every module on the vehicle. And Polestar was very open. They said, look, we're giving you a buffer, not much. I think it's 78 kilowatt hour full pack. They're letting you have 75. They're like, if we can give you more, we'll just update it over the air and they can change efficiency of things and play around with stuff. So, you know, these are the things that, you know, may determine your buying decision. If you buy a Mustang Mach-E, it'll probably be very conservative at launch. They're going right. to see how the cars do in the fleet and then they'll open it up as time goes. I think this is a great uh, strategy for a company's first battery electric true effort because it allows the best customer experience with the best hardware, but also protecting brand image and ownership experience and not having a service all the time. And Volkswagen Audi Group's been scared to do this for security reasons. It's not that they don't have the technology to do it, they just don't wanna put it in their cars because they're the Germans, they, you know, they're very, you know, every single little point freaks them out. That's partially why their cars are so good uh, in many ways. So it's this balance of, of you know, who's going to win? Is it the software driven cars or is it the hardware driven cars? Um, but no, I just looked on the used car market for Audi e-trons and they're just dipping into the high $40,000 price range here in the U.S., and wow. this price cut is only going to make them go lower. So as soon That's as right. that car is thirty grand. Maybe we'll get one. Oh yeah, right. So yeah, that's true. With, with the price cut, that means the uh, the the value of people's vehicles in their driveways is, is going to go down. You know, but but these these uh, this new 
this new model year is going to have with the lower prices. It's also going to be missing some content, right, Martin? Yeah, so they've added a new um, tier. So the the base model was premium plus, and now it makes sense because the base model is the premium. So they obviously, I think they are always knew it was on the roadmap because otherwise you would have called the old base one premium. Right. Uh, so then you are now uh, getting a car for you know the sixty grand, fifty nine grand car, but it does come without some of the things that you got on the previous base model, which was premium plus. So you don't get the matrix LED headlights, um, you don't get the heated and ventilated twelve way power front seats or the heated rear seats or the four way lumbar seats for driver and passenger. You don't get the Bang and Olufsen sound system. You don't get the wireless phone charging, uh, the fancy buttons inside, or the driver assistance package as well. So um, you know, it, and, and that makes sense because they've taken. Things off the car, money off the car, range has got better. It is a hardware upgrade, as, as well as, as you guys have said. So um, it's it's a great improvement. You get less for your money, but I would happily give up. It, you know, if it gets more people into a car at a, a sub 60k price point, I'd give up those things. Um, and and you can see this the now. Uh, you've got the the four different specs that uh, that you can go for. Right on. Hey, so let's uh, let's move on real quick. We just got a few minutes left. Uh, Elon Musk said it's highly likely that Tesla will make a smaller Cybertruck. Uh, he hinted at this in, in May, actually earlier, uh, re saying the review he reviewed the design of the Cybertruck with Franz, like uh, at that time, and they were going to shrink it, but even three percent smaller is too small. So the Cybertruck, the original Cybertruck, will stay that size. But he said they will probably do a smaller, tight world truck at some point and then yes. just a couple just a couple yes. of days ago a tweet <laughs> asked was asking uh so it's a smaller version for europe like don't want a model so he, the person was saying he didn't want a model y he wanted a cyber truck but even just a smaller eu version then elon musk replied highly likely down the road so if you like the idea of a small truck which personally i, I do because yeah uh, a lot of people like small trucks like i'd like you to drive this uh, old Tacoma to pre 2004 Tacoma, you know, that was actually a small truck. And I love that thing. It was so fun. It carried loads, you know, and it's all a lot of people need. And yeah. it, whenever people talk about pickup trucks in, in the comments, there's always several people asking for, you know, the old style of like the old Ford Ranger from the 90s size or, uh, or Toyota Tacoma size whatever pickups up so do you think cybertruck will get that small anyone i mean who needs three up front in in many cases so uh it's it's great if you can make a, a truck that big but we don't need a truck that big and of course if you believe twitter it means that elon said that because no one's ordering the cybertruck everyone's cancelled their orders <laughs> so he's been forced to make the smaller one and and you know as we know twitter is always right Oh. I didn't see that one. Yeah. That's great. You like you want a smaller cyber truck, there, Kyle? Well, as long as it can handle a little bit of air time, I can put some nice long travel suspension on it. I'm cool with anything. Right on. Uh, you have a you have an order for cyber truck, don't you, Tom? Yeah, I put an order in for one, uh, but I would have preferred it being smaller. Um, I just want an electric truck because I I always have one truck in in my stable um i have uh, i own some commercial properties and i plow the parking lot and my own driveway is about 400 feet long so i uh i plow it myself so um just for the plowing features alone i always have a pickup truck and um i would much prefer the cyber truck to be smaller um uh, I, i've been bouncing back and forth between getting the cyber truck or getting a rivian um i almost think uh you know i'd get whichever one i could get first uh, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to really know till production starts on both of them and, uh, you know, how, exactly how many reservations they have and how many reservations convert. So I'm just kind of keeping my, uh, my, my cards, uh, holding my cards close and seeing which one. But uh, I want an electric pickup truck. If it was smaller, I would prefer that. Yes. Right on. Yeah, that's an interesting use case. I didn't realize. So when you get your pickup truck, uh, say like say it's a cyber truck you're gonna stick a plow in the front of that hell yeah oh. <laughs> awesome that's great I, I grew up in canada and like plowing is like one of those things you know uh, a lot of people have you know pickup trucks and that's how they make their extra cash in the winter time because you need a lot of people with pickup trucks and plows to, to unbury everybody like you know it 
because it would have snow all the time. Yeah. So that's going to be actually pretty cool. It'd be interesting to see what like the, the power consumption and, and just how the weight affects all, all the, the dynamics of uh, snow plowing. I, actually, I, yeah, that's pretty cool. Looking forward It'll to make that. a good post. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, I, yeah. I'd like to try it out. Actually, I'll have to come up and plow your driveway for you, Tom. You're welcome. All you guys are. <laughs> Do a cyber truck right. snow plow event. So, so rolling right along, uh, Fit Chrysler said they're open to the uh, possibility of building an electric Ram pickup truck. I think the uh, Manly, the president, the, uh, the the head of uh, FCA actually said that. Which, uh, which they don't have anything at all, right? They haven't showed us anything. They're talking about you know the uh, plug-in Jeeps and and different things, but we haven't really heard anything about a so. How are they going to do that? Are they going to just like, I don't know. I think I think they're really too late. To, if they're just thinking about the possibility of building an electric pickup truck, they've like already seceded seceded the, the market to you know electric Ford, electric Chevy's coming. They got the they got the uh, Rivian cyber truck, it may, maybe a small cyber truck. Uh, is there anything left for, or, or does uh, FC have to like buy maybe buy cyber trucks and and put their own you know top on and uncyber it basically <laughs> yeah we covered this off last week there's no way that tesla are letting anyone have access to anything despite what elon may say on twitter yeah what do you think how do you have any opinions about fca and electric pickup trucks just in the interest of our half a minute left that we have on the show, uh, I think FCA has really done an extremely poor job with their efforts for electrification, and I think they will continue to do so. <laughs> <laughs> License Rivian, and there you go. Just stick a Ford cab on it. Right. Okay, so speaking of Rivian, real quick, um, River, uh, we were looking at reservation numbers on the site. There is people looking at how they can you know, right-click and on the reservation order and get some details and see some numbers on, underneath the underneath the skin on the order form. And apparently they have at least 30,000 buyers waiting for the Irving R1T. So that's, you know, just at that point to throw out there. That's a lot, that's a lot of trucks that'll keep them busy for a while. And that's that they're, they're only going to start arriving. I think next June is the pushback date now. So yeah, it's kind of going to be like you said, Tom, it's a race who's going to get their, uh, truck out there first, uh, Tesla is uh, going to town on preparing the ground for that terror factory. It's going to be interesting to see if they can build it, you know, as fast as they did the China, uh, China factory. factory. Uh, one other piece of news, uh, Lordstown motors, they're making the other pickup, electric pickup truck with the in-wheel motors, a very kind of industrial commercial kind of design. Uh, there are now, uh, if you're interested in them, they're now, a, or will be a, a public company through a merger with uh, Diamond Peak. Uh, just a little while ago, uh, Nikola did this uh, kind of merger. They call it a SPAC, SPAC, Special Something Acquisition Company. They kind of merged with this company that's already pre-made, already a public thing, it's just like, you know, bouncing along on the uh, on the exchanges. And it, all of a sudden, you know, you have a public company and you can invest in you want, if you want. Um, anyone? Don't need to comment if you don't want to. Okay. So other news, uh, the Tesla Model Y long-range rural drive is reportedly in trial production. So that's something to look forward forward to. Uh, do we think model that'll make a big difference in numbers or interest? No, I think they were planning only a $1,000 price difference is what I heard. Uh, and uh, most people are just going to go for all-wheel drive. The long-range rear-wheel drive will be the same, but it'll just go a hair farther. So... I don't think it's yeah. – uh, I hope they bring it back for the Model 3 because it's the best yeah. long-range travel variant by far. But to see mm -hmm. this need in their in their small SUV, I, I don't see the need for the rear-wheel drive configuration no. long-range. I see it for the standard plus, uh, you know, get the price point down. But they're not mm -hmm. accomplishing anything by doing it in the uh, long-range rear, unless it's China-specific. That could be – Wow, only a thousand dollars difference. That's I didn't realize that. That's a, I don't think yeah. it's confirmed, but uh, I think someone hacked the source code, and this is what they found. So we'll find uh, out. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was on yeah. the finance. Somebody put the finance page up of uh, Tesla's lease page, and right. they'd already put, they'd put the pricing up, and it was on at forty eight. Doesn't mean it's going to be forty eight, but that was the the mm. price that they'd listed uh, for the, the 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 leasing, and it was taken down. So when stuff gets taken off the internet, as soon as someone tweets about it, you kind of think mm, that may have been true, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, hmm, yeah that, it, 
if you're going to pay that much money, why not get all wheel drive a little extra? It's like, it's like that, uh, the Pulsar too, uh, that $5,000 for the performance package. And it gives you, you know, the big brakes and the, and the gold trim on the seat belts and, um, you know, a few, extra, a few extra, I mean, you're already paying that much money, five grand, you know, it's like extra four yeah. months of payments or whatever. It's yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think the model Y would have to be, there has to be a price difference of about $3,000 for it to, makes sense for anyone. A thousand dollars doesn't do it. I mean, that's that's what Tesla charges for the white interior. You know, yeah, it's less than their all wheel drive. You know, for for what they charge for a different color interior, is uh, it's kind of a no brainer. Right on. Okay, well, let's uh, wrap this thing up. Uh, that brings us to the end of our show. I would like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you have any comments about uh, any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post. The in the uh, YouTube comment section below, or on the NC- Inside EVs forum podcast thread, where you can find all the, our past episodes as well. And don't forget, you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Tom is at Tomalog. Uh, Mar- uh, Martin is at EV News Daily. And Kyle is at Out of Spec. And I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you.